Hi, and welcome back to the first session of the Vivimat workshop. The third talk today will be held by Martin Dienwiebel. He studied physics at the University Dortmund and the Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms University in Bonn. He conducted his diploma research at the Forschungszentrum Jülich using low temperature scanning tunneling microscopy and did his doctoral research with Jost Frenken at the Institute for Atomic and Molecular Physics in Amsterdam, the Kammerling Honors Laboratory in Leiden and the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Martin got his PhD in 2003 on the topic Superlibricity of Graphite. Afterwards, he worked in the Tribology Department of the IAVF Antriebstechnik AG. In 2008, he received an Emmy Noether grant of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and set up a junior research group at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and the Fraunhofer Institute for Materials of Mechanics, IWM. In 2011, he obtained his habilitation from the KIT and in 2016, he accepted a Heisenberg professorship for applied nanotribology. Since 2017, Martin has been a visiting professor at the Kumamoto University in Japan. He is associate editor of the journal Where and the editorial board member of Tribology Letters. In his free time, he's an enthusiastic aviator. Over to you, Martin. Cast iron, and that forms uh, the new material. 
And if we slide for even longer times, four and a half hours, you can see here that we have a nanocrystalline homogeneous layer, which contains all the chemistry of the uh, lubricant. That means the um, anti-wear additives, the friction modifiers, and the um, all the other additives that we have in this fully formulated engine oil. So um, to study the time dependence um, and to see how this uh, third body evolution forms um, in, as a function of time, um, this is not really easy. You can try to um, look at the contact with two different approaches. One is the um, so-called in situ approach where you have a transparent sliding um, counter surface here, in this case a sapphire sphere, and you can look with a microscope through the contact and see what is happening in the contact. Or you can have an online um, examination of your web track actually and you look behind the contact and there you can see only of course the changes um, on one side, on one of the two contacting materials, and you can look into the wear track. Um, we compared the two methods with a sample, with a, um, a model system, alum, aluminum sliding against sapphire in dry and lubricated contact. That was a work together with um, Michael Shockley and Richard Cromick from McGill University in Canada, and we, at the end, um, performing both experiments at the same time, we looked together on what we can learn from these two methods. Um, first, here you can see the uh, tribological experiments. Here on the left, we see the friction as a function of cycle numbers for the online experiments. Here in this case, uh, experiment lubricated with a simple base oil hexadecane. And here you can see the friction trace um, from the in situ experiment. What we find is here, in this case, this is not a very good tribological system. We don't see a decrease in friction, we see an increase in the friction force. After some time, we stabilize the friction coefficient around 0.3. The same thing happens also in the in situ experiment, and therefore we are quite um, convinced that we can compare these two experiments experiments um, afterwards using um, analytical techniques. First, we used a digital holographic microscope to look at the evolution of the topography in the wear track, and this is shown here. You can see here um, the roughness in false colors. Um, this color bar goes from 0 to 2 micrometers, and um, you can see here that we have, in the beginning, we have a reference increase which um, uh, matches the increase in friction to some extent. Um, and when we look into the contact, we can also see that we um, have here in the contact area some transfer occurring from the aluminum surface to the sapphire sphere. So this could be another uh, mechanism that can be uh, responsible for the increase in friction. When looking at the uh, microstructure using focused ion beam cross-sectioning, um, we were able to observe changes of the microstructure as a function of cycle number and load. So in the top panel you see a normal load of 2 newtons, and uh, here at the bottom you see a normal load of 8 newtons, so harsher conditions. Um, and what you observe here is that from going out from the initial microstructure, we see grain refinement um, uh, that occurs very quickly after the first cycle already. Um, and after 100 cycles, we also see void formation. This is uh, due to maybe folding um, that we have um, investigated in another publication. And after 3000 sl sliding cycles, we also see severe oxidation, which is um, visible here um, by the charging that we observe in the um, electron microscopy imaging. Um, if you do this with a higher load, this uh, progresses even more quickly and more strongly. And you can see that we have a really um, strongly oxidized layer after 3000 cycles. 
um, and uh, a strong grain refinement and also void formation underneath the surface. Um, the microscopic mechanisms that um, lead to this grain refinement are explained in the presentation of Christian Greiner, which you have maybe already watched in this channel. Um, we, in uh, addition to grain refinement on one surface, you have seen the aluminium surface, we have also um, transfer formation. You can see here the transfer patches on the sphere. And if you look into that, there is also um, perpendicular and parallel to sliding, um, very strong grain refinement and also the formation of shear bands in the contact. And you can see this material is highly oxidized also from um, XPS, photoelectron spectroscopy, um, depth profiles. So in this experiment you have seen grain refinement. This, this, um, this can be observed in many metallic systems. Here's another example of an experiment where we slid uh, tungsten against tungsten carbide. Um, also saw grain refinement in the, on the tungsten side and even amorphization in the tungsten carbide counter surface. Um, but there are also experiments where you start when you start with a very fine grain material, like in this case nickel iron. This is work here from Boyce and Padilla from Sandia National Labs, where you observe um, grain coarsening during sliding. So this is an uh, a mechanism which can go in both ways. You can have grain refinement starting from a large grain microstructure and you can have grain coarsening tribologically induced when you start with a very fine grain material and maybe this has not been shown yet. This can be even a dynamic process um, during uh, sliding. Um, it's quite difficult to observe this experimentally in simulations this has been seen. Yeah, so dynamic changes during sliding may occur and um, uh, can happen during the experiment. Now we wanted to study this um, grain refinement and microstructural evolution a bit more um, control in a controlled way. And then already some time ago, we um, thought about making uh, special samples, um, uh, um, kind of a model, uh, grain structure formed of multilayers. And therefore, we first um, had a sample where we had gold nickel multilayers on a silicon 111 substrate, in this case, five layers. Um, you can see here the AFM topography of the sample. And we wanted to change the interlayer thickness because this is known for multilayers that, that um, by this you can change the shear strength of the material due to the hollow patch effect. We particularly wanted to choose a material that cannot form an alloy. In this case, we use gold and nickel. And we, um, uh, by choosing this material, we made sure that we cannot have a gold nickel alloy um, formed, at least should not have formed this. Um, our experiments were performed in very well um, uh, controlled conditions. So we used a UHV chamber that you can see here at the bottom connected to our XPS system, uh, which we evacuated to a very low pressure, used um, UHV conditions. And in this first experiments, we used a steel ball and we performed experiments at the normal load of 80 millinewtons and a sliding speed of 0.7 millimeters per second. And what we found after our first attempt, which was already in 2010, was very disappointing. Um, we found actually um, very, a very strong increase in friction, um, which you can see here. Um, this is almost a friction coefficient of uh, two um, and more. And after some cycles, we had already fully delaminated this multilayer from the silicon substrate and we had uh, very extreme wear occurring here. So actually this experiment was a failure and we stopped this for some time. However, when we looked at the wear particles, we found some uh, uh, 
uh, mixing of the gold and the nickel uh, layers. You can see here the original microstructure, and this is a wear particle which is lying on top of the multi-layer sample. And you can see here strong mixing of the gold and the nickel layers. You can still see um, the individual gold and the nickel layers, so they have not fully mixed in this case, but they have formed these circular um, patterns. Um, in 2016, um, similar experiments were um, published by Aluo and co-workers um, here also from Karlsruhe, and they actually had better results. They were able to show that you find also these patterns and vortices um, in a multi-layer sample, in this case gold cop copper sample, um, upon shearing the sample. And um, these multi-layers have been also um, investigated using molecular dynamic simulations. Adrian Gola and Las Pastevka um, have done this, and they have um, uh, analyzed um, the pattern formation and found that you need a rough interlayer interface and a slight um, misorientation of, one, of the 111 planes that are here in contact um, to induce this pattern formation. So for this, please see the Bibimat talk by Lars Pastewka. Um, this motivated us to um, basically restart our experiments and we um, therefore um, went back to the beginning and to the deposition and uh, fabrication of better and new multi-layer samples. In this case, we used a large number of layers um, that was deposited by magnetron sputtering, um, again on a silicon substrate. And in order to investigate the interlayer spacing, we actually um, made five, uh, four different samples um, with different layer spacing, 100 nanometers, 50 nanometers, 20 and 10. And in order to keep the whole stack of the multilayer constant, we changed the number of pairs in order to always have one micrometer multilayer. That we have no um, intermixing between the gold and the nickel can be seen nicely here from this um, atom probe tomography um, scan of our multilayer, which was uh, made by Michael Wahl at the EFOS in Kaiserslautern. Um, and using these um, much better multilayers, we started again. Um, friction experiments in the UHV chamber. So in this case, we use a ruby sphere, three millimeters, which you can see here. And here uh, is the gold nickel sample mounted, and this is the cantilever of our microtravometer. Um, we did reciprocating sliding, 100 micrometers back and forth, um, uh, again in UHV conditions. What you can see is the friction coefficient, um, which we uh, evaluated from the friction loops for the different samples. What you can see immediately here is that for the 10 and the 20 nanometer samples, we have quite a low friction. This is the blue and the red curve here, um, and it looks also quite stable. When we increase the interlayer spacing from 20 to 50 um, nanometers, we see an increase in friction and it's still quite stable. We get a drop here at the end, but um, overall the friction is significantly higher. When we go to the 100 nanometer sample, where we have five pairs of an interlayer spacing here of 100 nanometers, we see a much higher friction which goes up to 0.6 at the end of the experiment. And we see here also several jumps, so a more um, uh, scattered friction result. So when you plot this, the average friction as a number of the layer thickness, you can see this a little bit better. We have quite low friction for the 10 and the 20 nanometer um, multilayer sample. Um, the friction coefficient around 0 0.15, 0 0.16. Um, the 50 nanometer sample has a friction coefficient which is already um, 0.25 or 2.24 in this case. And here the average friction of the 100 nanometer sample is 
um, again affected of two higher than the 50 nanometer sample. Um, now we wanted to understand um, what is causing the difference in friction and for this reason we um, used a model which um, was first proposed by Yamakov using molecular dynamic simulations uh, for the deformation of nanocrystalline materials um, and then um, adapted by Nick Agibe and Mike Chandros um, for the um, uh, tribological condition. So um, using the friction um, and the shear stress to, to as a deformation uh, mechanism. And when you do this, you can have two ranges of uh, deformation. You can have um, dislocation-mediated plasticity, um, which is here in this area, and you have um, grain boundary sliding or grain boundary rota or grain rotation, um, which is this area here. And when we uh, put our data points in this deformation map, then we find that our 100 nanometer sample would fit into the dislocation mediated plasticity um, area and all the others would go into the um, grain boundary mediated plasticity range. And we can see here especially the strong transition from the 50 to the 100 nanometer sample is in between this uh, line and on the first glance this looks quite nice. The only thing that we cannot explain is the increase in friction from 20 to 50 nanometers with this model. Um, so let's look closer into the microstructure. So this is the 10 nanometer uh, interlayer spacing sample uh, after sliding. And what you see here that we have indeed a layer here on top of the surface where the um, original multilayer structure is not present anymore. Actually, um, in this FIB cross-section, we cannot see any structure. This looks like a homogeneous material here on top of the surface. And we can count, of course, how many layers are missing, and there are a significant number of layers that has, have been used to form this new tribal material. Going from the 100 nanometers to the 20 nanometer sample, we still have such a layer on top of the surface. So we still have here the, um, some material on top of the surface which shows almost no structure. We have here some waviness, so there is also a topographic change. But um, what we see is that the number of layers uh, or the thickness of this uh, new material has changed a little bit but still we have almost the same friction here in this case. Now, when we go to the 50 nanometer sample, we um, suddenly see a pattern formation similar to the work that has been uh, investigated. Um, previously, we see here these uh, wavy structures and we can distinguish individual layers of gold and nickel suddenly. So here's the transition from this fully mixed material to something which is maybe partly mixed. Um, so only um, we get this, the, this uh, patterns, but we don't mix our um, multilayers completely. Going to the even thicker uh, interlayer spacing of 100 nanometers, we suddenly see a completely change in the microstructure. So you see no mixing at all. You just see plowing and a thinning of the topmost gold layer. So in this case, the ruby sphere is just plowing through the gold layer and there is no mixing observed. Apparently, this plowing mechanism um, has significantly higher friction than um, the uh, material, the fully mixed material and the partly mixed material. So here's that shown again. Uh, here, lowest friction for the fully mixed material, 10 and 20 nanometers, and intermediate friction levels for the uh, for this uh, partly mixed material and for the material where we only see plowing and no mixing, the highest friction. 
Um, and this is actually predicted also by the deformation mechanism map. Um, in a subsequent experiment, we wanted to find out if we have still individual gold and nickel um, areas also in the thin, thinner multilayer samples, and this is here a TMEDS map. Um, here on the top, you see the TM images. Um, eight layers have been mixed together here in this area, and we can see here at the bottom the gold and the nickel map, and we can see basically even distribution of gold and nickel, there is some enrichment of nickel at the very surface, which we don't understand fully. But overall, we see basically a 50-50 um, mixing of gold and nickel in this zone. So we have really fully mixing and maybe even the formation of a gold-nickel alloy. So this is here also investigated by electron diffraction. Um, we see here individual, we can't see individual fragments or layers of gold and nickel. And when we use electron diffraction to uh, measure the lattice spacing, this would um, correlate with the calculated lattice spacing, which would be theoretical present for a gold nickel alloy. So it might be possible that we have shear reduced um, gold nickel alloy being formed here. We cannot um, prove it completely because the lattice spacing is very close to the gold spacing or the nickel spacing, and therefore we cannot resolve this answer completely. Um, here you can see in comparison to that the, the 50 nanometer sample where we, um, when we look at the elemental maps of the gold and the nickel, um, we can still see the nickel layers and also the gold layers. So here we have not the fully mixed material present, at least not everywhere. Um, together with um, Nick Aguilé and Mike Chandros, we um, went also to Sandia National Labs, where there is a similar microturbometer um, in a nitrogen-filled glove box. And here we also did microturbological uh, experiments um, this time not in ultra-high vacuum conditions, but here in dry nitrogen. And when we um, compare the UHV experiments with the dry nitrogen experiments, we get similar friction coefficients for the thinnest sample and for the thickest sample, but the intermediate uh, layer thicknesses, they deviate quite a lot here. We have a different friction behavior for those samples. So something different is going on here in this case. Um, and also the microstructural evolution looks a bit different. When we look into the 10 nanometer and the 20 nanometer sample, we have here again uh, some tribal layer, um, which uh, looks a bit different than the original material, but looking into the micro uh, elemental maps, um, we see that this top layer is um, still almost only composed of gold. Um, uh, very few nickel in between. You yeah, can see the nickel map. Um, and so there is uh, not the formation of a gold nickel mixed material in this case. Um, so no gold nickel alloy formation in this case. Um, what we see here is we see a small, in X, XPS scans, we see some uh, carbon peak and a gold peak, uh, an oxygen peak, and there is uh, so some contamination present, which we don't have in the UHV experiment. Um, for the 100 nanometer multilayer sample, we still see what we have seen already in UHV, we have here plowing through the um, just the gold layer and uh, the depth of the um, wear track depends here on the individual uh, grains within the gold layer. So they are different from grain to grain. So that might be due to the different orientation of the gold grains and we can see here this location 
um, tile lava at the grain boundaries. Um, and therefore, we can confirm here the dislocation mediated um, uh, mechanism that has been also proposed by um, Nick Agibe and Mike Chandras. So, to sum up, um, we find that metallic multilayers are ideal model materials to understand tribal material formation and to study the effect on friction. We saw that this, there's a strong increase in friction with increasing layer thickness, and there is a tendency of mechanical mixing and even alloying when you go to thinner layers. Um, we form possibly a nanocrystalline gold nickel alloy, which cannot be thermodynamically stable, but can be formed under shear. And we can see here when we compare UHV with um, uh, nitrogen lovebox experiments that there is a significant effect of adsorbance, um, in this case carbon and oxygen, on this um, mechanisms of mixing and pattern formation. Yeah, with this I like uh, to acknowledge the co-workers here in this uh, work. And um, this was Evo Jihan, Michael Stüber and Harald Leiske, Leiste, who did the multilayer preparation, Heike Stürmer, um, from the doing the TM analysis, and Nick Agibe, Catherine Newton Wolheim, and Michael Chandros from Sandia, and the aluminium sapphire experiments that I showed you in the beginning were done by Pancho Stoyanov, Dominic Linsler, and Michael Shockley as well as Richard Cromick um, at McGill University. Funding was um, provided by the Deutsche Forschungs Gemeinschaft. presentation. And to all you viewers out there, please remember to leave your questions and comments in the comment section just underneath the video, so Martin can prepare some answers that we're going to stream live at our Q&A event on December 3rd, 1600 hours CET. Please consider subscribing to this channel so we can notify you when we upload new content. And with that, cheers!